thank you for today. Uh, Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for uh, this group you put on. Let the uh, things we discussed be a blessing to them and then to others and uh, help us to make wise decisions and live lives without financial regrets, uh, knowing that uh, we're more important than anything else, uh, serving you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's jump on in here. And it looks like everybody's logging on the hour. So there we go. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, wealth management for May 2021 and how different this feels and is than uh, last year in May when we were doing a similar presentation, only not knowing when this would end, if it would ever end, and all of us basically being from home. So, you know, the theme today, both in the and then how that impacts our investments, and then uh, when we do the uh, professional it's really all about getting out of the house and uh, starting to enjoy life a little bit more. So, We'll have three sections, as we always do, um, in advanced planning, basically just some thoughts, nothing groundbreaking, but some thoughts on the aging, how to make that more proactive and smooth for both yourself and um, the people you care about. And then on relationship management, we're going to have uh, senior travel advisor, Amy Mayhew, talk to us about um, travel and what she's saying there now. And um, one funny line when we did the pre-interview for it, how travel today is like toilet paper in March of last year. So, you know, as you can imagine, lots of demand and things going on there. Um, so let's jump right into it. And if you have questions along the way, um, you can either type them into chat and Juliana will be paying attention to that or um, feel free to just inter interject um, also. So, all right, so to start with, and this is even put together from uh, data at the beginning of the month, the economic reopening is going great, and you're seeing it more in some parts of the country than others, but pretty much everywhere, you know, when this came out, we had not yet had the CDC's new guidance, but uh, pretty much everywhere is starting to look a little bit normal, um, and even in some of the places that were the hardest lockdown, you know, New York's and California's. Um, starting to really get out and have some economic activity. And with that, what you're seeing is, and this is the expectation. So remember when we're talking asset prices, both stocks, bonds, other things you invest in, if they do as expected, not much will really change there. But if they do better than expected, you're going to see you know, significant increases. If they do worse than expected, that's where you see a pullback. But if they do as expected, um, just because, for example, Q3 here says 7% GDP. It doesn't mean it's going to be a surprise if it's 7%. And so it starts to get priced in. And then when we start to see GDP slow down here, which is just normal, right? We're having such big GDP numbers and growth right now because we're coming out of such a tranche. Um, and also, you know, when you look back a year ago, you know, this is when we were all locked down and, and no one was doing anything. Now we're starting to get out of our houses. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing, though, when it turns to a more normal level out here. It's just that we got to remember when that happens, you know, it's we're starting to price in these numbers for later on. But I thought that was kind of cool. And in a lot of us in our entire lifetime, we've probably never experienced 8% GDP growth before. And then with that, GDP is now at the all time nominally at an all time high. So by nominal, think of the difference between real numbers and nominal numbers. Nominal numbers are just what are those numbers? So a good example is, you know, if I have a dollar, I always have a dollar. But if there's inflation, the real purchasing power of that dollar can go down. So it's still a dollar. It hasn't changed from being a dollar, but because that, that's the nominal amount, but the real value of it, meaning what can I get for my dollar goes down. But nominal GDP is at an all time high. Here is based on the expectations had we not had the pullback we had, had we not had COVID. So this dotted line here is kind of where the economy was going pre-virus. This line is where the economy actually has gone and where it's expected to go. And what's really interesting about this, and it's really funny because of the government stimulus, the technology that got uh, pushed forward as far as technological innovations being adapted, um, new you know, types of businesses. If you really look at it, we are going to cross that pre-virus path and stay above it for you know, the foreseeable future. And that's really neat. So whereas this has been a lot of hardship, 
we're about to end up eventually by the end of this year, probably being in a place that's better off than had we never had this um, experience from a um, economic standpoint. That is obviously there's some things that will have probably changed and, and never go back. And then one other note here, and this is also good when you think about you know, this perspective of the GDP over time. But one thing you're finding is household savings are higher than um, historically normal. And so with that, you're gonna have a lot of purchasing power, which means these people that have money, whether it be from wages increasing, stimulus checks, um, saving money because they're not going out. Um, when they get out, more into the economy later this year, they'll have money to spend. And I believe, and a lot of other people believe that that will create some pent up demand and a lot of activity. They're gonna to wanna to go do things they haven't done. And certainly Amy will hear how that's already taken place in travel and a lot of um, leisure venues. And then also just one more amazing thing to reflect on. And let's just take this back to investment context. I remember a lot of you guys about a year ago, you know, we're talking about the pullback, we all get what happened. And I would get the question, wh when is it gonna be back to where it was? Or when will my investments, you know, if you had that high water mark, we all pay attention to it, you know, I finally hit a million dollars with my investments, for example, when's it gonna be back to a million? Well, guess what? This time last year, I would not have thought that it was gonna be back really by the end of 2020. And, you know, I would have told you that all I was doing anyway was guessing because I don't have a crystal ball, but look how fast just in um, economic activity has come back. And then also in comparison, and when you think about the slow decade after the Great Recession, how long it took for the Great Recession to come back, whereas here just so quickly, and that's still important for us to reflect on. And then also what's happened much faster than the Great Recession is wages coming back. And you'll hear a lot of things about how it's actually hard to find people to come in and do a lot of uh, the jobs businesses need. And that's true. And so that's starting to pick up um, how much you, you have to pay employees at this point in time. And then um, wanted to also say a large part of the personal savings that's going up is because of that income going and that they are able to save a little bit more right now, uh, leading back to that cash that we had talked about before. All right, so where is this taking things in the investment landscape? So one thing that has changed a lot this year, and I think you're going to see these changes sort of slow down. If we thought they were going to continue at the pace they are, um, we, we'd be making different choices in the portfolio. But one thing that's happened this year is interest rates have climbed. And they've not climbed on the short end. The short end is still negative and at an all-time low. But when you go out, you know, I want to borrow money for five years, 10 years, 30 years, those rates are going up. And what that'll do is uh, put some pressure on the bond portfolio for the bonds you currently have. And, you know, if we continue going up, we want to make some adjustments there. Our belief with rates going up, and you'll see a little bit uh, here in a second about inflation, is that it's probably going to be kind of short-lived because this inflation spike that we're seeing due to um, really supply chain interruptions from COVID um, is probably going to, towards when we get back to more normal economic activity, mellow out. And if that happens, there's no real reason for rates to keep climbing. And so what you've seen is the short end of the curve, meaning money that you borrow and pay back within a short amount of time, it's really stayed the same, but then you've had this rising of and the way to think about reading this chart is the longer out you borrow, the higher your interest rate is, right? And so here's where we were in uh, October of 2020, and here's where we are today, basically. And this makes sense to all of us. You know, if you want to borrow a 15-year uh, mortgage, they're going to give you a lower interest rate than if you want to borrow a 30-year mortgage, because it takes longer on the 30-year for them to get their money back. But one thing that this has done, if you look at the stock market, is every time this has gone up, you've had some volatility. But if you really do believe that this is going to start to normalize or, or settle out, you're not going to have to, um, you know, there's not going to be as much volatility as, as there was when this is climbing. And then on the bond side, it's also made things where maybe we can invest a little bit different towards the end of the year than we are now, but no immediate changes. Um, and then back to that idea of inflation, 
So if inflation has picked up, you know, certainly acknowledging that, certainly paying attention. I think it surprised a good number of people and you saw a little bit of a pullback there in the hike in interest rates. But if you look at some of the areas, two of the areas that are most, and this goes right with Amy, um, where you're seeing the most, it's things like airfare and lodging. Um, yes, those are big inflation numbers right now because you went from no one doing it to a good number of people doing it. But again, that'll at some point normalize, we, we believe, um, after we get through this uh, little COVID section. And then one of the biggest positives I'm seeing right now, I mean, we are going to have you know, straight up the rest of the year, but I think you're um, starting to see reasons why um, you know, the market it really does deserve to be where it's at right now. And one of those is for the first time since 2018, we're actually having earnings growth drive the S&P 500. Ever since then, earnings, it's really been more multiple growth. And it's always better to have earnings growth than multiple growth. So think of uh, multiple growth this way. I earn $100, somebody's willing to pay me $800 for my business. Well, that's an eight times multiple. But if you earn $100 and somebody's willing to pay you nine times, $900 for your business, that's a nine times multiple. Um, what you'd like to see is not necessarily that multiple climbing, but instead that this business goes from earning $100 to earning $150. And when you see that, that's, that's usually a good sign of a healthy market. And then one other interesting part of the market and our approach to this in y'all's accounts is really to start diversifying a little more than we have been and certainly more than we did last year. So last year, we were able to be very focused on tech and some of the COVID friendly sectors. This year, it's hard to have a lot of conviction on one section versus another. And so what you do when you're in that type of, I'd actually say more normal environment is you, you diversify the portfolio more, right? And let's just say I own 10 things. I don't own all 10 of those because I think each one of them is gonna do better than the other. I own all 10 of them because I'm not sure which one is. And that is a, um, oh, hold on, I have I have, go, go look at it. I haven't seen it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, there, there's a, a 2020 COVID moment. My wife just got home and she's wondering where my son is, who I thought was in the basement playing Lego. So we'll see where this goes. I'm sure she'll find him pretty quickly. But if not, I'll um, go help with that. So anyway. Um, all right. So back to this growth versus value. So you had seen a long-term outperformance on growth stocks versus value stocks. And you're starting to see that shift a little bit this year, but it's not, it's, it's not a, a sure thing. I think this is one of those things where if interest rates normalize and take out, you can actually see it go back to growth, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen there. But it has been nice to see these taking turns on leadership versus growth being the clear leader, which it really had been for the last five years. Um, and what that does is give us the opportunity and we rebalance this in the portfolio where we sold some of the growth assets, bought some value assets earlier this year, gives you the opportunity to kind of sell what's expensive and go buy what's cheap. And so if you're looking at the market, there's almost always parts that are expensive and parts that are cheap. Obviously, you want to buy and focus on the parts that are cheap. And then one just kind of interesting thing, people are often wondering about the international side of the portfolio because it has lagged the U.S., um, it appears the economic um, recovery overseas kind of has stalled a little bit, and the U.S. is significantly starting to outperform. Um, certainly have our eyes on that, but I will say with that happening, you're getting yet another opportunity where is international pulls back a little bit, it looks just that much cheaper than the United States, and it's one of those, you know, maybe over the next five months, it doesn't do better, but it's very possible those stocks could, you know, be a great investment over a three to five to 10 year time to price. And then we got this tax bill that's out here. And here's what I want to say about the tax bill. I'm going to wait and see what's passed before I start making any planning changes. Obviously, we can give you this slide. You can Google this and see it. I, I personally think, and a lot of this is coming from a uh, very high end CPA um, that did a workshop I attended recently. Um, certainly, you know, knows, um, you know, lobbyists and people of that nature. And what's actually going on. A lot of what's there and not very, don't have much legs. 
Um, but with the Biden proposal, I think a lot of what he's talking about is because he knows he's going to have to negotiate. And yes, I think you're going to have taxes raised for people making over $400,000, certainly uh, probably long-term capital gains raised for people over a million. You know, what happens with things like step up and basis and brackets for, you know, the, the average person, you know, to be seen, but I don't see a huge impact actually for most people on this call. But certainly for some people, there'll be a significant impact. And one of the things that might happen for people on this call is it could end up being on the estate planning side that we make more changes, more so than on the income tax side. But we'll keep watching that. And, you know, one thing I've learned about politics is don't put too much energy into figuring things out until they actually get passed, because, you know, you could get all excited about something like, you know, raising the uh, ordinary income rate from 37 to 39.6 but, and then it never ends up happening. So we'll see. And you know, certainly having um, uh, Republicans in the position they are in the Senate, I think will slow anything down. All right, so that's it on um, investments for right now. Any thoughts or questions before I jump into a planning idea? All right, so let's jump into how to help your parents and yourself live better at 80, 90 and beyond. So first of all, what's exciting about this topic is human longevity. And it is amazing how much longer humans are living now than um, you know, a century ago. Um, and actually, I think for the first time, you're starting to see that come back a little bit, which is an interesting stat depending on how you see it. But um, and I think it's a trend that's gonna continue. And certainly, you know, if you invest in your health, and that's something you do early on in life as a, a gift to yourself later on in life. Um, the idea of living to 90 and even 100 and beyond is very, very likely now. And so, you know, a few things have to happen. And I want to encourage everyone to be intentional. The biggest regret people have in this area isn't that they do planning and it's the wrong planning. It's that they don't do anything and they're not intentional. And often... We all think we're in better shape and a little bit more invincible than we are, or we just don't want to talk about the less fun things. So, you know, starting to be intentional about things like, do I want to stay in my home or am I going to move into a assisted living or, or other retirement community? If you're going to do that type of move, when is the best time? Um, one thing I was talking to a client recently, one thing they were thinking about is if you're already in a home, and this is for their parents, and your cognitive uh, decline starts to keep you there. If the cognitive decline happens while you're in your home and then you try to go somewhere, they can re reject you until you have to go to a nursing home versus assisted living. And if you're a person that wants to be in assisted living versus the nursing home, you know, that, that might be a problem. And so, you know, thinking ahead on when are these changes going to be made, how to do them. One thing, and um, Juliana can pass out the article that goes more in depth. One, one suggestion was when you think about your home, a lot of houses with very small little um, renovations can um, make a huge difference as far as like widening things, um, making stairs more accessible in and out of bathtubs. And then the other thing is early on, and this is something as a advisor we sometimes see happening in meetings. Also, you know, certainly, you know, when you're watching your parents, be careful and watch out for early signs of cognitive decline, because if you live long enough, it happens to all of us. And then also keep in mind, the power of um, socialization and how uh, loneliness can really be something that both ages you faster and hurts your mental health. And then there is no place like home, although not everybody's going to want to stay there. But if you are, here are just a few suggestions. So, you know, do you need to swap out existing hardware to make it more accessible? Can you widen doorways or certain doorways uh, in case a wheelchair at some point in time? Um, you know, when you're thinking about where to have your furniture and how to lay things out, can you create space where possible um, if that happens? And then also focus on the first floor. So, you know, I look at my house, for example, and it doesn't necessarily have the right setup between my basement and upstairs for somebody who's not good at walking up and down stairs. So that's great exercise for me now, but it might not be the kind of, you know, ranch style house I might want when I'm older. And then also um, one of the biggest things is make sure to safeguard yourself and your financial well-being. And so there's two things that I think come really clear at this is one, investing impulsively. So you want, this is where I feel like is 
financial advisory firm, we can add so much value to people in the aging process is let's say, you know, you are aging and maybe the cognitive ability is not there the way it was and something like COVID happens. You know, are you likely to impulsively sell at the wrong time? I mean, I have people that are 50 year old executives that are struggle with that one. And then also being sure not to fall for uh, scams and exploitation. There are a lot of people who uh, put together a lot of really good scams to take advantage of seniors and just make sure you are um, protecting yourself and educating yourself and, and possibly even uh, parents on um, what some of those may be and how to avoid them. And then finally, um, making sure before something happens, and I tell you what, if your parents don't have these and you're going to be the executor of their will, for example, what a gift you can give yourself by getting this all in order. And if you're just talking about yourselves, what a gift you can give your children. So one, go ahead and plan now. Make sure you have the right documents in order. Things like a uh, power of attorney, you have to do before it's needed, not after a lot of times. Um, make sure you've communicated with your financial advisor and um, you know, CPAs and attorneys so that if um, your, your kids have questions or need to step in and figure out where stuff is, uh, they can help with that. And then also, of course, always watch for the uh, early signs. So anybody here have any questions or maybe even just tips to help live a better life uh, while going through this aging process? All right, well, then make sure you uh, wash and moisturize your face also. That'll help you age better as well. <laughs> I'm just teasing. All right, so let's jump into the fun stuff. And I went through our investments, get through our planning, and go on vacation right now. And um, I thought this was very well-timed going into summer. And in fact, it was kind of funny. We... Um, talked to a couple of professionals uh, to be on this month, and they all said, well, I'd like to do it, you know, in, uh, but um, I'm going to be on vacation this week. And so that led to, well, you know what, why don't we just get a travel agent to come in here and tell us uh, um, what's going on and maybe give us a few tips. So Amy, would you like to introduce yourself and help the group kind of know what you do and what your path? Sure. Can you hear me? One of us is frozen. Is it me or you? Go ahead, Amy. You. Okay, good deal. I think I froze for a second. So I'm Amy Mayhew. I am actually in Mississippi and am out of Magnolia Travel Group, which is a local travel agency here. Been there about four years or so and specialize in family and couple vacations, whether it is an adventure, a ski trip, an all-inclusive Europe, Hawaii, um, that sort of thing. Love doing it. It's a lot like um, there's some, some similarities to what David does as far as what it what being a travel agent involves um, and why you would use a travel agent um, as far as expertise, convenience, advocacy, and treating you as a person and not as a number. So it was kind of interesting listening to David talk before I got on. I was like, this really, you know, is kind of a parallel thing. It's all about relationships when you work as a travel agent and getting to know the person, their desires, what they like and then helping them plan a trip that is going to be, meet the goals of that trip, whether it's to create memories with family, whether it's to relax and go away um, with your loved one and just have some downtime, or whether it's to seek out a new adventure and check an item off your bucket list. We're there to help and figure out what meets your needs as a person, not as a number. So. You mentioned advocacy, and I think a lot of us probably on the call and people we know may have had some issues last year with traveling with COVID. And you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater personally and say, oh my gosh, I need to always be worried about a pandemic when I make my travel plans. But at the same time, you know, I, I went through an experience and I know a lot of these folks where I wish it was easier to get my money back on a flight and a trip I had planned last year. Tell us about the advocacy aspect and where you see that going, you know, kind of in the future now that we're on the other side of this pandemic. So that advocacy was a huge piece of what I did in 2020. It was, as you can imagine, nobody was traveling in 2020. We didn't know what was happening. And so the flip side was that I spent all of my time that I would normally spend helping people book trips, advocating for them on the backside to get their trips pushed out for another year to two years, to get them a refund, to get them a, tra a travel. You kind of froze a little bit. Um, you said all the time advocating for them to. Oh, no. Uh, I spent all of my time last year advocating um, 
getting trips rebooked for the next year or two years. Um, I have one person who we planned her trip in 2019 and she's finally traveling next week. Um, so advocating for rescheduled travel, advocating for refunds, advocate, advocating for vouchers. Um, I had some instances last year where we didn't think the person was going to be eligible for a refund. But one thing, one thing people don't know about travel advisors is how we work. And we work with, we call them suppliers a lot of times. So we may work with um, Delta Vacations where I can package your air and your hotel and your transfers and your insurance all together. And that makes it very easy for me to have a key contact to say, hey, this hotel is closed. And I know we they're not giving refunds, but can you help my client out? So I was able to get a lot of vouchers last year for people that may not have had insurance and may not have otherwise been eligible for a refund according to the hotel's cancellation policies. But because we have key contacts and work in a, a different or a specific way when we book trips, I had a lot of leverage to help out my clients. Not to say I didn't wait on hold a lot. I waited on hold a lot last year. Well, and just think about one of the things I was thinking is how much I waited on hold and it'd be nice to have somebody like you to wait on hold for me instead. Uh, yeah, I, I've had a lot of people say that. They're like, I'm so glad you're waiting on hold and not me. And I'm like, well, that's, yeah, that that's yay for you. Not yay for me. Waiting on fun, waiting on hold was not fun. I would have two lines going at one time, um, sometimes trying to get through to multiple different suppliers. So it was challenging to say the least. Um, we've seen a lot of shifts in the travel industry with people now working um, from home remotely. So that has helped bring back um, travel personnel. They can work from home and remote in like we're doing now. And that's been tremendously helpful as the demand for travel has kicked up to have all those people working again. Yeah. So tell us about that demand for travel and why it's like toilet paper in uh, March. And then also, what do you see going on with prices right now? It is insane right now. Uh, travel agents usually have a, we call it wave season. And we say you're riding the wave from January to early March. It's like the CPA's busy time of year. January to March is a travel advisor's busiest time of year because everybody's gotten through Christmas and they're ready to book their trips for the summer. And so 2020 ended, started seeing a little bit of demand for travel pick back up. January rolled around and we all got a little busy and we thought, great, you know, we're going to see a little pickup. Well, wave season has not ended. Um, it's, it's crazy right now. The demand for travel is through the roof. People have pent up energy. Uh, they got stimulus checks. They got, ex they got unemployment checks or they saved their money because they weren't going out and spending it in 2020 and they are ready to take a, a trip. And a lot of these people are ready to take a big trip. They're ready to go somewhere. So consequently, the supply and demand feature is in play right now and prices are reflective of that. So airfare is high. Um, resorts are high. Rental cars, I'm sure you guys have seen the rental car demand on the news and online that there are rental car shortages because to stay afloat last year, um, the rental car agencies sold off a lot of their fleet. And so the demand for travel has come back much greater than anyone expected. And so sometimes, you know, there've been cases of people getting to a destination, thank God, not for me yet, um, people getting to a destination and not having a rental car. Uh, it's, it's very much like toilet paper of 2020. Um, you couldn't find it, you wanted it, you were looking for it, you were paying whatever you could for it because you had to have it. And that's how we feel about travel right now, or that's what we see people feeling about travel right now. They are ready to go. Are there any deals that are better than others or places you might want to consider that maybe otherwise you wouldn't because of this unique environment? Um, it really depends on the person. Right now, um, Mexico continues to be a, a hot market. Mexico and the Dominican Republic continue to be a very hot market because they do not require COVID tests to go to the destinations. Um, and some people do not want to deal with a COVID test to go on vacation. So, so they pick Mexico and the Dominican Republic. And those two destinations tend to have the best bang for your buck. I always try to steer people away from thinking about deals per se, because, you know, to me, if I say, oh, I'm going to get you a great deal, that means, you know what, I'm just going to click some buttons online and I'm going to look for the best price. And I like to think, no, I'm not really looking for the best price. That's important. Price is important. Don't get me wrong. But I look for the best value and the best bang for your buck. So somebody may say, hey, give me the best deal out there for that. And I'll say, well, what are you looking for? I will get you the best value for your buck and I'll try to make it as cost effective as I can. But 
Nobody ever comes back from a vacation and says, gosh, I wish I had, I wish I spent less on that vacation. No, nobody ever says that. They, they, they come back and they say, I wish I hadn't stayed in that two and a half star hotel that I, that I asked you to book for me. I wish I'd stayed in the four and a half star hotel that you had recommended. People want value for their money. They want to feel like they're getting what they pay for, or they're getting a good value for what they pay and that they're getting the experience that they want. And travel is all about the experience. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, a couple of things come to mind there. Um, you know, for example, Disney, you know, going without a fast pass versus a fast pass. I mean, my gosh, do you want to stay in line or do you want to go on rides? You know, and I remember one time on a walk on the beach in Mexico, uh, my wife and I uh, ended up meeting this Canadian couple and they were staying at the cheap resort next door to our resort. And all they talked about was how awful the food was and that they didn't want to eat anything. And we were just talking about how much we loved our food and, and thought it was wonderful. And, you know, that comes to mind with what you're saying. So um, let me ask you this. What type of trips, and we can go, you know, any direction you want on, on the um, Mexico-Dominican stuff if we do, or just other types of trips. But what types of trips are most important to use a travel agent on versus just, you know, booking it yourself or finding a hotel, you know, on, uh, on Expedia or whatever? That's a great question. So that, that kind of is what travel agents are dealing with right now um, in the age of the internet is why would I use a travel agent instead of why would I book myself online? And certainly there are some instances where you're very comfortable and you should definitely book yourself online. Like if you have been to, I don't know, let's say Chicago, if you've been to Chicago a hundred times and you understand the flight system and you understand which hotel you want to stay at and how to get there, by all means, jump online, book yourself at the, at the Four Seasons in Chicago and go for it. You don't necessarily need a travel agent for that. You may want one to save you the time of doing it. And that's, that's absolutely great. I say you typically need a travel agent if you are A, inexperienced, um, particularly if you are inexperienced in traveling out of the country. I actually recommend a travel agent if you're traveling out of the country at all, because one thing that we can typically get for your um, travels is cancel for any reason insurance. Um, and that has proved to be invaluable during COVID um, to be able to get your money back. A lot of insurance um, options that are out there will give you a voucher for future travel, or they will only let you get your money back if you um, meet certain stipulations, like you had a documented illness from a physician, or you had a death in the family, or you lost your job. But that cancel for any reason insurance clause has proved to be wonderful. Let's say you were getting ready to travel and you just didn't feel comfortable with it. And you didn't really have a specific reason, but you changed your mind and you didn't want to go anymore. You could get your money back from it. And that, has, that is one reason to definitely use a travel advisor. I am not familiar with any insurance policies out there that are, can be booked outside of a travel agent um, that have that cancel for any reason clause, particularly important for your international travels. I would also say your multi-destination travels um, throughout the U.S. If you want to do a multi-stop, I have uh, clients actually that flew out today going to Alaska and they are doing a driving tour of Alaska and they used me for that. And we put together a lovely week long driving itinerary that involves um, planes, trains and automobiles. Um, they're doing a flying tour, a helicopter tour, a train tour, and they're driving um, for a week in Alaska. And so a, a multi destination, multi stop itinerary with lots of complex components is always good to have a travel advisor help you out with that piece. Yeah. We well, you know in thinking back on the aging well that we talked about earlier, I remember one trip we were supposed to go on as a kid. Um, we were supposed to go to a Florida destination, ended up just going to, I think, like the Georgia coast so we could drive back. But the reason it changed versus going somewhere far away is uh, my grandfather fell and had to go into the hospital. And my mom didn't want to have, you know, she wanted to be able to get back um, if needed. Um, while, you know, going through some stuff that was on it. And, you know, you think about that and that, that's possible, you know, or, you know, as a parent, you never know when your kids are going to need you and you have to change your travel plans. And then there's all kinds of other, you know, obviously negative things like COVID that can happen, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good um, perspective there. Um, tell me, do you ever work with Airbnbs or is it always through like name brand hotels and things like that? Ooh, that's a hot topic right now. Um, we are, some agents do and some agents do not. And I'll, I'll give you the perspective on both. Um, Airbnb and, and Verbo or VRBO are not 
vet it out. You don't know what you're going to get when you go into either of those environments. You could have a lovely appearing VRBO or Airbnb online and you get there and it's a piece of junk. And I have no way to vet that out before you get there. Um, and so that's the negative. The, and we try not to. We have a few suppliers that carry some uh, vacation homes and we try to book vacation homes if we're booking them as a travel agent through those vetted out suppliers because we know that they have checked them out. The quality is there. They're not pieces of junk, basically, when you get there. Now, will I say, whenever I get a request for the Florida Gulf Coast, I tell people just go to Airbnb or VRBO because that's where everything is on the Florida Gulf Coast. That, that Nobody works with travel agents down there. So there are going to be some destinations that are really hard, like um, um, Gatlinburg that sort of thing. You know, there's not a lot of demand for travel agents because the VRBO and Airbnb um, demand is so high there. And so many of those properties are, are just owner owned. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what are some trends you see going? Cause obviously, you know, it's kind of like this whole, are we going to work from home or not thing, right? It's hard to sit where we are now or in the middle of COVID. And I remember, you know, somewhat into COVID, people are like, no one's ever going back to the office. And now look at this. We're all kind of going back to the office, but in a little bit, you know, maybe different fashion, maybe work from home some days and uh, in the office other days. What kind of trends from this environment do you think are going to stay with us for travel versus go away and back to normal? I mean, will we always be wearing a mask on a plane? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, the middle seats aren't being blocked on most airlines anymore. So I think we're going back toward normal with that a little bit. Um, one thing you did say about working from office, the office versus working from home is we saw a large, large increase in the uh, connectivity of these resorts in the Caribbean and in Mexico. They upped their Wi-Fi capabilities significantly in an attempt to lure people working from home. They said, why would you work from home when you can work from the beach? I've got lovely, and they were given extended stay specials and everything. They're not having to do that so much right now. Now the demand has picked back up. But initially, they would give you, you know, two, three-week, four-week specials to come and stay at their resort and work from the work from the beach. Um, and it was quite, quite nice for them. So I that's been a very good perk that I think we'll see. I think we'll see the increased connectivity stay as they realize that people are having more options to work remotely. That's been great. Um, I have personally seen a, an uptick in the amount of people asking for couples vacations. People, people were with their kids last year. We're kind of sick of our kids at this point and we want to get away. <laughs> so I've seen a huge uptick in the amount of people wanting to take couples vacations. And that may be domestic and it may be international. <laughs> they just say, get me away from my kids for a week. So on that note, um, you know, the homeschooling was the hard part about that. I saw one resort, um, the Cloister down in Sea Island. It, here in Georgia, they were offering that they would there or you stayed a place by it. You drop your kid off, they do a classroom, homeschool your kid for you, then at the end of the day, you pick them up. But I thought that was so funny. Um, what you about know, sanitation of, stuff? Or go ahead. Oh, some of the resorts actually had a mobile classroom set up to bring your kids as well. They they had, uh, they would call them tutors and they would have little laptops set up so that you could bring your kids and let your kids um, zoom in to, to their classes. That is Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My kids tried to talk me into doing that and um, it was a no-go because <laughs> I knew once I got into the beach, it wouldn't happen. And that's why these investment plans are so important. We got to get people with enough money to actually do stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, how about Disney? Tell us about that because I know from this call and a lot of people on here and the folks we talked to, you know, that's one of their favorite places with their grandkids and, you know, mm -hmm. they'll um, a big trip for some of our clients has often been uh, taking their kids and grandkids to Disney. Um, what are some thoughts on that? If you want to go to Disney, you better book early uh, and you better book soon and definitely use your travel advisor for that. Um, it's much easier and your travel advisor can help with um, restaurant planning. When fast passes open back up, they can help with the fast pass planning and that sort of thing. But the demand is huge. In fact, our uh, agency had a group message going yesterday that there were no resorts left at Disney World for Thanksgiving. It's sold out. It's full. Um, so people are going back in droves. And I think particularly now, just last week, they announced um, that you don't have to wear masks outside. So the demand shot up even more after that. And it's booking very far in advance. So if you want to go, you definitely need to pre-plan that. 
Right. Gone are the days that we can just show up at Disney and, you know, not not have pre-planned it. Yeah. What are some interesting locations that you've done for clients or think about that maybe people wouldn't think of or even, um, you know, maybe really good in this environment and time? So like a good example when we were talking, you were saying Yellowstone was a place that you surprisingly saw a huge tick up um, back, you know, during COVID. And obviously, you know, you think about Yellowstone, what you do there, that makes a lot of since um what are some some unique experiences that maybe people aren't aware of um you know it may not be unique to you guys in georgia because it's a lot closer than it is in mississippi but uh, the florida keys have been a huge um a huge destination um that people want to go from here and we do a may not be so unique, but we do a, a driving tour where I tell you what's at each mile marker and you can go down and stop at, at the different mile markers and see the attractions that you made. Like the largest uh, metal lobster in the continental U.S. is on one of the mile markers, you know, going down the Keys. So little random tidbits like that. Uh, national parks remain a huge um a, a huge draw and there's some unique experiences there like the mule ride um, to the bottom of the Grand Canyon spend the night at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and ride your mule back out again the next day so there's some definitely unique experiences there as well um, wellness resorts in the Caribbean are, are also taking a taking off um, so there's resorts that with yoga focus um, healthy eating focus so there's a lot more niche and specialty trends that we're starting to see kick up um, and there's some domestically that have that focus as well. So we're starting to see some of those more specialized um, areas of travel pick up. And then adventure, Costa Rica, huge. Costa Rica is a huge family destination right now because you can do the rainforest, the cloud forest, the jungle, and the beach all in one trip and can have a very wide array of experiences while you're there. Let me just ask you, because I'm curious, I've uh, never been before, the Florida Keys price-wise is it super expensive or moderate? I've always, I, I, I don't know, but I've always perceived it as being a relatively expensive destination. If you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said, oh, it's very reasonably priced, but it is, it's, I'm seeing double the price right now compared to what I was in 2019 and 2020. Um, there are a variety of accommodations. I would say there's not a ton of value accommodations. If I think value, moderate and luxury, everything is more to the moderate to luxury end in the Keys. Um, and it also depends on if you're traveling with your family, the age of your kids, you may not want to go to Key West per se and spend your entire time in Key West because your kids are going to be bored after about three days if they're little kids. Um, some of the activities down along the Keys, going up and down the Keys are probably going to be a better fit if you're a family. And those are things that we talk about when you say, hey, I want to go to the Keys. Okay, did you know the Keys don't have huge sandy beaches and there's a lot of rocks, you gotta get out, get out into the water. So there's all sorts of questions and determining if the Keys are really what you wanna do. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Like when I've looked at the Keys online, it seems very hard to understand one key from the, the other unless you've been on the ground and, and doing mm -hmm. it. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's see. Um, what else that I should I have asked you that I haven't? And then I'll, I'll share a little story and let's open it up to the group here. But is there anything you can think I of? I think we covered you most know? of it. Okay, cool. Well, I just wanted to give you a testimony. So I recently booked a trip with Amy and I tell you what I loved about it so much is I had no idea. So what we were really looking for is a all-inclusive resort in Mexico, but with a separate sleeping area for my wife and I and the kids, right? Because when we're all sleeping in one room, nobody sleeps and that's not a good vacation. And so, um, you know, she was able to figure out where, where had that a lot easier than I was able to. And it was a great experience to, you know, get what I want and hopefully, um, you know, an awesome upcoming trip. So anyway, thank you so much, Amy. Really appreciate it. Yeah, um, does you, were, anybody... you were super easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was an easy trip. I could have had a comp. Next time, I'll give you something more complex. Multi destination, fly into Vegas, fly out of Phoenix, and go to the Grand Canyon along the way. Check, done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and and how do you make how do you make Vegas family friendly too? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like Key West. But does anybody have any questions or um, anything you guys would like to ask Amy? I mean. I'm sure that if this bores anybody with the questions, they can just drop off. But some of y'all might even have destinations in mind. Like, hey, we're really trying to do, you know, California, or I thought about the U.S. Virgin Islands. So feel free. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask before we wrap up? All 
All right, well, I'll take that as a voting no, but um, with all this said, thank you. Oh, I, I know the last question I, I was meaning to ask you. I was sitting here thinking this when, when you were talking, and I started rambling about my vacation. Um, all right, so I gave the trends that I thought on GDP and kind of you know how that'll affect um, you know maybe interest rates and inflation going forward. You know, obviously that impacts the portfolio a little bit. If people are looking at these prices now, and I realize it's a crystal ball, just like I can't tell you where the economy is going to be in a year. You know, I can tell you my prediction, but I can't tell you. If you had a crystal ball, someone's going, God, you know, while the keys are double the price, I don't want to go, but maybe I want to go in 2023 or summer of 2022 instead of 2021. Is there a time in the future you think prices on travel are going to normalize a little bit more? I do, especially for domestic. I feel like by by 2023, we will see domestic travel start to come back down as people travel this year. And I think next year is going to be really busy as well. I feel like we'll start to see it. I feel like we will start to see it normalize more in 2023. Um, European travel has not completely picked back up. I've started getting a few requests, like as Greece has opened, I'm working on a honeymoon to Greece right now. Um, those requests are st slowly starting to trickle back in. So I feel like 2022 will be our busy year for uh, Europe as we start to see it open back up. So my advice, particularly if you want to go to Europe, is book early. Uh, book that early. Otherwise, I think 2022, 23 may be our busy season in Europe. I think there's going to be a lot of hesitancy from people initially to go back over um, until they know what's happening with all the numbers and the healthcare and everything. I think we'll see some hesitancy and then we'll see it rushed off again. And it'll be a couple of years before it comes back to normal there. Okay. Cool. So that, that's interesting to hear and, and know because, you know, if there's certain trips that you can put off, people might want to do it. And then there's other trips where, you know, like I'm thinking, you know, kids at Disney, for example, there's just, you, you want to go before they get to a certain age, right? Or, you know, if you have a, a kid that's about to graduate from college and you want to do that one last family trip beforehand, that might not be worth putting off. You know, it might be worth just biting the bullet, but mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, good. Well, we'll have you back on in 2023 and see if you're right. And yeah, probably have a much different conversation at that point in time. I'll be like, you know, can we now go to buffets again and not have somebody serve us? <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I, well, you know what? I'm honestly going to say I'm not opposed to the uh, to the to the assisted buffet. I, I don't want to touch anybody else's utensils. Um, and I thought it was gross to begin with. But um, I, I'm not opposed to the buffet going away and it. it all being assisted. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's funny, um, you know, things that maybe before didn't bother us, like a water fountain. I was thinking about that the other day, walking by a water fountain that's in the hallway of our office. And I'm like, you know, I used to use that thing all the time, but now that just looks like a germ pool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting how long, you know, those types of thoughts stay in our mind or do they ever matter? So. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, I hope everybody got a lot out of this and um, enjoyed your time on the webinar today. Um, you know, as always, thank you so much for the partnership with us here at Merit. We um, really enjoy working with you all and, and truly wish the best for yourselves and your families. So um, go out and have a great If you have travel plans, I hope they go wonderful. Um, if not, then, you know, certainly uh, maybe consider it and it If um, any of y'all need to talk to Amy about stuff, I'm sure she'd be happy with you reaching out or contact me and, or Juliana and we can connect you. But um, one thing I would is, and, and actually, Amy, this is one thing I forgot to ask you that I probably should. The way, so if the clients work with you, sometimes they would pay you, but a lot of times it's the same price. Yes. Yeah. Can you, uh, I think I froze. Oh, I was talking about compensation for yeah. a travel agent. I was going to say, oh, great question. the same price. And yeah. just the hotel pays you, right? So they don't yeah. even have to come out of Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great comment, uh, great question. Yeah, a travel agents mostly work on commission. So we get paid on the backside from our suppliers, whether I bundled your package together through a supplier or whether I booked it directly through a hotel. Um, we typically, I'm going to say 90% of the time, get paid a commission. Some travel agents charge a planning fee, some don't. Um, I will charge a planning fee if it's going to be a complex multi-destination itinerary. If you're going to go to Europe and I'm planning your... I'm planning 10 days through Italy where you're on and off trains and getting transportation arranged from train station to hotel to train station to the next hotel. You know, we'll charge a planning fee for something like that or a, a national park trip where you're having multiple destinations and you're, you know, heading across South Dakota down to Yellowstone back to uh, Salt Lake City. Um, 
there's not a lot of commission in those type things. So you will have some, you know, agents that build in a planning fee for that. All right. Well, cool. All right, guys. Well, everybody have a great summer and we'll see you next month. Thanks. All right. Thank you.